Good afternoon and welcome. We are really delighted you could join us today for a conversation with our music director, Stefan Deneve, uh, to discuss his role as music director and his first season um, as music director of the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra. We're deeply grateful to the Stewart Family Foundation and Worldwide Technology for making this program possible and truly deeply, deeply grateful to you for your engaged participation, for your support and the many ways that you inspire great music in St. Louis. These have been challenging times, but you, we know that you've been here with us and we truly appreciate everything you do to continue to make the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra one of the finest in the country here in St. Louis. Um, You'll find for those of you who are uh, less familiar with Zoom, there's a chat room where you can ask questions. My colleague Vicky Batwell will monitor questions and will make an attempt to answer all of them. However, I, I may, um, I want to note that there's over 170 participants today. We may not get to all of your questions, but I assure you that we will capture them and make sure to answer them over the course of the next few weeks. So, Stefan, bonjour. Bonjour, Marie-Hélène, and bonjour, St. Louis. Thank you for everybody to be here tonight. Thank you. So, Stéphane, since you left on the St. Louis on March 15th, you and I, with the board, had to make the very difficult decision to cancel performances on March 11th, and you went home to be with your family. So, how has life been for you since? Uh, it has been a mix of emotions, I would say, uh, like everybody. I had my share of uh, uh, sadness and anxiety and, you know, watching the news up with obsession. Uh, so that is uh, the, the, the sad part of it. But I would like to focus on the uh, positive part of it, which is that I feel very lucky. I have a great wife. We have a great daughter. And I never spent so much time uh, <laughs> as just now together because... Uh, we are now more than three months without any traveling, which is really, I mean, I don't remember when that happened before. And uh, we enjoyed uh, very much nature. The spring here was exceptionally beautiful. So uh, we could see the, the transformation, the explosion of nature every day. We do a walk o'clock, actually at five o'clock every day. We have this routine to, uh, to walk together. Uh, we spend a lot of quality time together. We ate well, drank well. Uh, I play the piano a lot. Um, I've been actually uh, uh, also sick, and my wife has been sick, so no worries. Um, uh, it was mild symptoms, but we did have the coronavirus. Uh, we have been tested uh, positive with antibodies. And normally, I'm now your immune uh, music director for at least 12 to 18 months. I mean, most likely, we're not sure 100%, but most likely, what is sure is we, we had the, the, the sickness. My wife, for two weeks, um, uh, she lost smells and, and the taste. Uh, I had fever for only four days. And uh, during all this time, we've been uh, confined here at home with our daughter, Alma. But strangely enough, or she has not get, got the, uh, the virus. So she, she's still healthy. And we are back to be healthy, and as I said, it's kind of a relief because uh, it has been really with mild symptoms. Well, it's good to hear you're feeling better and that you look well as well. I know we've, we've been privileged to get some of your videos um, since we, we've been in this pandemic and it's always a joy to hear you and, and talk to you. Um, so tell me, the 1920 season was your first as music director of the orchestra. You had been a, a very regular visitor since 2003. So share with us your impressions of that first season. Well, first, it's a great opportunity, thank you, Marilyn, to tell to everybody, merci, merci beaucoup. <laughs> thank you so much for welcoming me so warmly and uh, make, I mean, you really made actually St. Louis my uh, musical home. And uh, uh, it started um, uh, already, of course, the season before when I was designated, I could feel the bond between uh, the community, the orchestra, the, the singers and myself. 
but uh, I have to say, I was blown away by Forest Park. I loved it so much. I really felt a, a connection that day. And so that was the first highlight uh, of the season. Then, if you remember, maybe uh, some of you, it was my uh, kind of musical wedding with my best man, Jean-Yves Thibaudet, who also was my best man in my real wedding with my wife. And uh, uh, there was something old, something new, something borrowed and something blue in this program. And I really felt like there was a, a wedding with our fabulous musician who I want to thank to as well. And um, after that, we did Malo uh, too with uh, the chorus. And uh, I was so pleased in Forest Park to have my first actually collaboration with in unison chorus, which I treasure. And um, after that, we did uh, well, the uh, New Year's concert was a lot of fun, I have to say. Also, uh, we welcome on stage John Williams, my hero. And uh, that was a very, very, very special moment for everybody present, and certainly for the musicians and myself. And we recorded Brahms 4. We went to the Cronut Center in Illinois. Uh, I can tell you now already because I had a lot of time to do the edits of this uh, recording that it's if I may say that myself, of course, the playing, let's speak about the playing, the playing of the musician is exceptional. It's so good. Um, and then later on, uh, we had also uh, some um, uh, uh, concert with, with Jean-Yves again, which was a pleasure. And uh, it ended, unfortunately, too soon, but still with, uh, with a bang, we finished with a bolero. And uh, uh, I mean, I told to the orchestra how impressed and how proud I was to be music director of an orchestra that could deliver such, such a fine played bolero. It was yeah. something quite great. That's wonderful. And at the time we had to cancel, you were preparing for Berlioz, Damnation of Faust, and the, the preparations were truly uh, extraordinary. And I know that it remains one of the most heartbreaking moments of our career together, the, the having to basically postpone the production to a later date. But tell me, you, you knew this orchestra for close to 16, 17 years as a guest conductor, becoming music director. Tell us what's so special about this, so unique about this orchestra. Indeed, uh, it has been very organic uh, because I know them since a very long time. And uh, I was always coming back for one reason, because I loved it, because mm -hmm. I love making music with them. But indeed, now I know more why, actually. And uh, the reason is, uh, it's a very old orchestra, not, not, not its members, but uh, the orchestra itself, the mm -hmm. institution. And uh, uh, this orchestra has an incredible history. And I believe in souls in an orchestra. Mm -hmm. I believe that um, there is something that started and then which is uh, uh, catered by the, by the uh, curated, sorry, by the, by the conductors. And, uh, uh, and, and over the years, there is a slow change of personnel. And so something is left from the start and it enrich, enriches the, the DNA of uh, the orchestra. Mm -hmm. And this orchestra has a very rich DNA, very versatile because there has been some conductor with a lot of uh, German, actually, uh, uh, background. Of course, uh, lucky for me, it was also a, the longest tenure was a Frenchman, uh, Vladimir Goldschmann. Despite his name, actually, he was totally French, and he brought a lot of French repertoire, and I can feel that it's still in the DNA of the orchestra. And more recently, of course, there has been some wonderful uh, American conductors, uh, Leonard Slatkin, uh, and David Robertson, and both of them had done a lot with um, new music, lots of new music, and uh, uh, a lot of American repertoire as well. And so I feel basically that this orchestra can do everything, and, uh, and that he has also a very, very special warmth. And that is a reflection, I think, of the quality of life and the, the, the community in St. Louis. Now that I visited a lot of restaurants, a lot of places in St. Louis, I understand why people are in a good mood, uh, why there is this kind of good feel here. And, uh, and it is um, in the sound of the orchestra, especially with our beautiful hall. I mean, Powell Hall definitely helped to shape a warm sound because this hall is extremely warm. So, uh, so voila, so that, 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 that makes all of that a very special orchestra for sure. And uh, there is something extremely musical. Um, so that sounds a bit strange because you would think, every orchestra is musical, uh, but 
somehow uh, some orchestra are listening to each other even better with a certain sense of um, of real chamber music like uh, attitude and and i think this is the case for our orchestra and i notice that particularly when we do some uh, uh, classical music we did earlier some mozart and i want to do more mozart with them because uh, i really think uh, I mean, I cannot think of another orchestra uh, in the U.S. that can play Mozart with such this level of refinement and elegance. And uh, uh, yeah, it's a. I, I mean, as you understand, I I love this orchestra. Well, this is one of one we love Mozart too, so it's a perfect perfect match. So let's step back a bit. I'm curious to hear your thoughts about your role as music director. So how do you envision your role, and how do you approach this role, and what does it what are the, what does it include? You know, what what is your your vision about your role as music director? Well, it's a very broad range of things. I mean, the the, the nuclear element of it, of course, the, the most important thing is to uh, curate the orchestra and the development of the orchestra and give them a feeling of direction, a vision. So definitely my first role is to create this intimacy, uh, this understanding uh, with the orchestra musicians that we feel we built something special, special sound, special attitude, special interpretation for every piece. I would say, for instance, recently we played another highlight, by the way, uh, we played Beethoven Ninth Symphony and uh, I was very happy to uh, build a certain type of Beethoven uh, playing, and I think we'll continue in, uh, in, in that style and, and, and research about Beethoven. And even if it has been played many times, there's always something new to do. But uh, um, on, on top of it, I would say there is the programming. So uh, what is the vision about what, why you put program together, which soloist you uh, invite? This is a very important part. Uh, I work with uh, with you, actually, Marilyn, also with Eric Finlay, uh, very much to uh, uh, and Jan Kivler to 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 imagine programs that make sense for the orchestra, for the community. Uh, I I love programming. I love programming which which has a, a sense of narrativity that tells soft stories, and um, uh, so that is for me a very big part of um, of music music director. It's to to, to curate the, the, the full season, not only my weeks, but the weeks of uh, other guest conductors and soloists and just make a real journey over the season. And uh, then obviously there is the communication with the people we make music for. And uh, I particularly love that aspect. Um, uh, as people know, I love to speak, I'm afraid. And uh, I love to communicate on stage with our audiences and um, and and to create a link with uh, with with them also off stage. So I'm very happy because uh, our great staff and and you, Marilyn, you organized a lot of wonderful meetings and uh, sessions where I could discover and be introduced with a big part of the community, and uh, and that is also for me very important because I turn my back. <laughs> when I conduct, right? I, uh, I'm obliged to face the orchestra and, uh, uh, and I feel obviously the energy behind me. I feel the, the listening, but uh, still I, uh, I don't see the audience. And so I love to start a concert facing the audience, looking at everybody and uh, just try to connect and uh, kind of mm -hmm. break the possible little glass window in between uh, the audience and the stage. For me, we are here to celebrate something together, and uh, and it's really a way to uh, to connect, to maybe even change some passive listening into active listening. You know, so I, mm. I try to tease or to explain why I love a piece, why we decide to do that. I feel I'm I'm like a sommelier, just explaining, you know, uh, a wine and and what flavor you may feel and and uh, this kind of thing. So I I, I love to communicate. And, uh, and for me, it's a very important thing as well to be in sync actually yeah. with, uh, with, with the city and, and with the people, um, especially for instance, uh, with what happened recently with those very tragic events. So does the audience uh, surprises you some, sometimes? I mean, do you come on stage with some expectation and then they, they, they surprise you either by their openness or either by the, the silence, the way they listen? Or how, do you have times where you are 
that this may influence the way you conduct an approach and interpretation? Actually, this little speech that I usually do uh, on top of every concert is really a, a moment for me to, uh, to George, to, to, to just feel a little bit what is the energy. And I have to admit, of course, that uh, for us, which is uh, against social distancing, but more people is better. Like you really feel that uh, uh, I love, of course, to have on stage and to see a very packed house. We had uh, some last season, like the Beethoven 9 or, or the John Williams concert was totally packed. And, uh, um, and it is an incredible uh, energy and it, it really influences you, definitely. It gives you a, uh, yeah, a feeling of uh, adrenaline, you know, just uh, that builds because you, you don't want to disappoint. You want to give the best you can. And, uh, and, and I personally, I don't have stage fright, luckily. I, I, I'm very impatient to go on stage. People backstage, they always know that I'm like, ah, let's go, let's go, uh, because I can't wait to be there and to, uh, and to connect. And um, so first, there is this moment where I face people and, and it's very human. I feel what, it, what, what is the energy in the house. But then uh, it's very interesting because then I really, when I conduct, I, um, I really feel if, um, if the audience is with me, Somehow we uh, we go on a, on a journey. I really feel sometimes we we sail on the sea, and uh, and I can really feel if there is a, a gentle breeze or uh, sometimes uh, when a, a, a piece is less well known or where when there is a piece that could is uh, be less powerful at the moment, you really feel the audience actually just losing a bit of concentration, and uh, you hear a little bit of moving of people moving their their programs or just slightly um coughing or this kind of thing which i'm very curious what will happen by the way now with coughing uh, i hope people will never feel uh, um, bad to cough again in a concert hall it's normal uh, it will happen again but um uh, i um i can then sometimes react to that you know i i, I just i just feel okay I have to uh, maybe just slightly push the tempo or make a little dramatic rupture. It's, uh, it's a bit like when you conduct an opera. I used to conduct many operas. I, I, I was actually kind of an opera conductor at the start of my career. And uh, you really feel when you conduct an opera that you, you, uh, you have to help the drama and to kind of create some uh, rupture moments, some, some, some effects, uh, dramatic effect to a, uh, to create suspense or to create excitement. And, um, and so sometimes it happens in a concert that way as well. I, uh, I react to, uh, to the energy behind me. So let's talk about how you prepare with the orchestra. I mean, there's great lessons in leadership that can be learned from, from orchestra conductors. So as you step onto the podium, how do you get the orchestra to prepare for a program? What's your approach? Well, the first thing is people sometimes don't know how short it is. Uh, we re usually rehearse with um, four rehearsals. So a rehearsal being two and a half or two hours. Uh, Sometimes we have five, but it's often four. And it's really not a lot of hours. So uh, you have to come with a plan and um, know exactly what you want, especially when you have in front of you an orchestra of the level of uh, the St. Louis Symphony. People come very prepared, they're very professional. So they individually prepare their part, they know what they want to do, they know it technically, but they also have some ideas. And, um, uh, and, and the, the thing which is very important, I think is the first reading. I usually try to, uh, to read at least uh, a movement, if not the full symphony, just to have this um, almost animal contact, like to just, to just, you know, like you would ride a horse for the first time you just want to, to feel the spirit, to feel what the horse can give you first. You have to accept. And, uh, and then, I'm afraid, I, um, uh, I often interrupt to, uh, to say what I would like. And, uh, and I'm laughing because um, ideally, in a perfect world, a conductor, he or she should just express everything only with the hands, with the eyes with the energy, but um, uh, it's not always possible. So you have to sometimes verbalize 
what you want. And I love to explain sometimes um, my imagination, you know, and I, I love the sensations. So um, I'm a conductor who, um, uh, maybe because I'm, I'm a French conductor, I, I like to do like in, uh, in the Baudelaire correspondence, uh, famous poem where Baudelaire says that the perfume, the color and the sounds are responding to each other, are answering each other. And I feel the same for me. When, uh, when I conduct, I, I want people to really have a many senses experience, to almost uh, smell the perfume of the music, to, uh, to, to have some visual, uh, even if it's not precise, obviously, but to have uh, some, some kind of sensations as well in the visual way. And uh, I try to communicate that to the orchestra and, uh, and sometimes I speak too, too much explaining that, but, uh, uh, but, but because it's very important to me to, uh, to, uh, to have people just um, uh, understand why I'm doing something and what is uh, the reason. And uh, mm -hmm. so that's how we do. And then we have a dress rehearsal where we uh, read everything without stopping. And normally we're good to go, but every concert is different. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I love that every concert is fresh and is, for me, still a part of the process. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we didn't play perfectly something. So every concert is just continuing the process of, uh, of making it better. Mm -hmm. So I've watched you in rehearsals and what does this, you describe as getting all the senses around the music. It's, it's, it's wonderful to watch, but also you're very invested in uncovering the narrative of the music. Mm -hmm. so, and and the, the theme of this season, of, uh, it, it, it was the Franco-American uh, connections and, and we could find that thematic connection through all of the music you program. And I love this to go outside of, of our uh, immediate um, works and just con continue to understand the various ramifications of music. And on, on that topic, I'm interested to talk to you more specifically about works that you might um, present with the orchestra that are more familiar and where you may have a different approach to the mm -hmm. interpretation. And I'll use an example where this season, when you brought a performance of Beethoven 9, you had very, very, very clear ideas about Tempi for this piece, which is, of course, very well known and has been done many, many times, and which is probably one of the key pieces of the repertoire that most of your musicians have done, you know, in school, as, you know, later in life. How do you approach um, shaping an orchestra to give you the interpretation that you have in, in your mm -hmm. head? And, and when it's actually such a standard work that it's almost automatic, they will do it from a certain way, but your way is not the expected way. So how do you get them in four rehearsals to, to shed the, what they've acquired over years and years and years and, and go into a different direction? Thank you for the question. First, um, the fact is I want first to say that I'm not somebody who wants to have a provocative uh, interpretation. I believe I have a reasonable ego, I'm afraid, but <laughs> not, uh, uh, not, not the kind of ego I think that wants to be different for the sake of being different, just to mm -hmm. put my stamp up on a piece or something. Really, it's not my case. I feel so much, I'm a servant of the composer, but so much, really. I, I feel that that's why we are there, and the truth is in the, the text. Uh, and uh, What's happening is I'm studying a piece in a kind of the old school way. It comes from the time when I was a uh, Kapellmeister, which means opera conductor, uh, permanent opera conductor uh, in German houses, in German opera houses. So I was for four years Kapellmeister in Dusseldorf. And over there, uh, you have an incredible turnover of opera. And if you want to um, uh, work with the soloists, uh, the singers, you can do it, but you have to do it yourself playing the piano so uh, often. So you, 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 you have to just know the piece at the piano yourself and, uh, and just you know, sing the other part where the, singer, the other singer are not there, you work with one and not uh, the duet. And uh, this has been a wonderful way to learn how to reduce scores on the piano. So on my piano, there are always um, uh, orchestral scores. And now, thanks to you, by the way, thank you. I, people should know that I have a new piano uh, in, uh, in, in my dressing room uh, in St. Louis. And, uh, and, uh, and I love it. Uh, I love to be able to play on the nice baby ground, but still 
Steinway piano, it's wonderful. So I, I just reduce all the lines of the instrument into my two hands. And therefore, I'm obliged to really read what is written because I need to put my finger on the right keys and uh, this doesn't come automatically. So um, some people sometimes learn a score just listening to recordings and reading it. But if you do that, you don't really go in the core of the piece, in the, in the truth of the piece. I think you need to feel it yourself to just understand the chords. And, and the, so that's how I do it. And because I, um, I learn it this way, I tend to get very close to the text, what is written, and I discover a lot of things. And what is very surprising is uh, our art, um, of course, over now three centuries of orchestral music, uh, somehow, um, some pieces have been such um, uh, uh, masterworks, I mean, the treasure of humanity that they have been played so many times that there is a tradition. And tradition is often the, the last old habit, I'm afraid. And so it's always good to just look at the text first. And in the case of Beethoven 9, it's very strange F looking at it again, because I wanted to do something good uh, for our concert. I realized there was some indication of tempos that uh, were really not respected because they were so to be just crazy. And I, one by one, one by one, there were 14 tempo indications that were difficult to, to, uh, to understand. And I just tried to, 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 to go into the process of Beethoven and why he wanted this tempo. And, and all of them started to make sense. And what is very strange is that um, there are hundreds of recordings of Beethoven 9. And I don't think there is really any that um, just uh, offered me what I imagine looking at the score. So uh, it was fantastic to try things and to feel this kind of um, excitement of the new with a piece which is so well known. And you need for that the uh, open mind of the orchestra because of course they know the more or less traditional way to do it. And so uh, I remember when I started, for instance, uh, in the scherzo, so uh, there is an accelerando, and then usually the tradition divides the next tempo just by two. And I've always been annoyed by this tempo. I always thought like, this is so repetitive and it sounds a little bit like uh, almost pompous, like, you know, almost like pomp and circumstance, which is really not the spirit of Beethoven in this, you know, urgent symphony and, and crazy symphony. And then I, I really thought, okay, I need to try to do exactly what is written, which it seems nobody does, which is to accelerate to exactly uh, the tempo. I mean, for the technical aspect, it's quarter equal quarter. So it's continued. So you have a tempo with three notes in one bar which should go to uh, the same tempo again, but with four notes in one bar. So obviously you need to put more notes in the bar, so you have to accelerate before to get to a speed of this note that suddenly in the samples, you can place four notes instead of three. So this makes And suddenly I thought, oh my God, this is really the kind of revolutionary feeling. This is this kind of anticipation of the march to the joy uh, at the end of the symphony. And, and it made totally sense. And I could not even now uh, imagine it otherwise. It has yeah. to be like that. And it's what is yeah. written. Yeah. So, um, it's interesting. So well, I, I remember, I think I remember hearing textures and layers in this wor work that I had never heard before, because you approached it in, in a manner that we had never heard this before, that, that way. So. Well, I mean, thank you very much. I, I honestly didn't want to, uh, uh, to, to shock people or to do something uh, uh, that would just uh, be revolutionary. I just wanted to serve what I believe were the 
the spirit intention of yep. better yep. because yep. so how do you get your orchestra to kind of stretch that muscle right for repertoire that is so anchored into their dna in a way because they start very young they learn the repertoires you know in youth orchestras and like whether it's beethoven nine or any other work you did two Brahms symphonies with us and again they were textures and colors you extracted from these works in, in your approach. So how do you get musicians to stretch that muscle? Well, let's be honest, it takes some time at the beginning of the rehearsal. Mm -hmm. I remember when we did the second symphony of Brahms, mm -hmm. I wanted this to be uh, just very, uh, very free and quite a little bit rubato more than usual. And, and uh, uh, sort of Viennese in a kind of sense of valsy feeling. And I remember discussing with our fabulous, uh, really fabulous uh, principal flute, Mark Sparks. And uh, he said it took us actually a few rehearsals to just understand why, what he wanted to do exactly. And uh, it, it's, uh, um, uh, it's not right away, I wish, but, uh, uh, um, and in this case, for instance, in this Brahms too, uh, it's very interesting because the musician put on the table something and I still need to accept it first before I kind of sculpt it in a different way. Uh, I, 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 it's, a, it's a living matter so you know it comes in a certain shape and you have to react to this shape first and um, that is a fascinating process I have to say. It's a, uh, it's a lot about your own conviction. Mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, if you're really totally convinced and you hear it in your head so much, it's kind of a telepathic experience. I found that extraordinary. I, um, uh, I must say, I, I'm a very Cartesian French, two plus two make four. Uh, uh, I don't believe in paranormal, uh, but, but uh, conducting is maybe the closest experience to proving telepathy mm. because you really sometimes just uh, imagine something so strongly in your head that you influence the mood, you influence the, the, the phrasing, and without clear indication, something really like impose, like, uh, just, just you are, and sometimes it's enough. I mean, it's like in life, huh? we, we all have had some first dinner with somebody we wanted on the, uh, to love, and then you feel the energy, the flow is easy, and sometimes it's not. And uh, uh, it's all about this flow in between people. And, uh, and at the same with an orchestra, there is a lot of love around uh, and, uh, and, and, and passion, and uh, it can go wrong for the same reason uh, if, you, if you just uh, don't communicate and don't just shape uh, your vision naturally. But it, it has to be um, natural, I must say. If it's yeah. force, uh, if you really ask somebody to, 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 to play with a, with a wrong fake accent, it sounds like it. Yeah, um, that's beautiful. And it, it, it's clear that for you building that trust and the listening and, and uh, enable your orchestra to, to step forward with their own interpretation, which comes to match yours, seems to be very important. Um, let's talk a little bit, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the clock, but wanted to hear your views about new music because your approach when you're bringing a work that the orchestra has never worked on or never played, uh, with the challenges sometimes composers write for certain instruments and sometimes it creates enhanced difficulties because the, your players might say, well, you know, that register is really hard on my instrument or this or that. So how do you, what's your approach with them when you read a new work? And what's your approach in general to selecting you know, mm. composers that you're going to want to commission for future works? Well, um, to start with, I, I think the, the leadership um, of a conductor changed over the years. It mm -hmm. was born in the 19th century in a time where there were unfortunately really clear social class and uh, somehow uh, the conductor was a little bit of the, the boss in the old uh, school way and, uh, and the musician were the workers obliged to do what the kind of king you know, imposed. And luckily this changed totally. I think now uh, uh, there's no secret of course to, uh, to be a good leader, but for sure I think what is necessary now is to be honest and to be uh, uh, interacting with respect and, um, and also show your vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So it is important for me that uh, the musicians 
understand that I don't have all the answer and that they have to propose me also some solutions that I may not have thought about. And uh, it doesn't all come from, from me. So it's, a, it's, you know, uh, it's an interaction. And uh, uh, when we do something which is very new, uh, I, I try. It's not easy because um, I still in a part of my life, I think, where I'm very much into uh, uh, showing and wanting what I dream. And uh, I think there will be a time later in life, it's a big journey, where I will suddenly accept more uh, what people give me and, 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 and maybe be better doing that for sure. But um, at that moment, I, I, uh, I still try, when it's a new piece uh, for all of us, for instance, to, um, to really listen. 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 I mean, in orchestra, listening is key for the musician, for the conductor. It's all about listening uh, and connecting through really a very, very intense uh, listening. But uh, what is important as, for me is also the, the, the repertoire that we, um, that we bring to the orchestra. And uh, I'm very proud of um, the new pieces we, we brought last season and the reaction of the audience. You know, I started my season with uh, Jennifer Higdon, uh, Blue Cathedral, and uh, Kevin Putz, Virole. And, uh, uh, and I, I, um, uh, I was very pleased to see that the audience reacted well, it seems to me, to, um, to a certain type of music that I want to bring, which is a very melodic uh, new music, a music that has a very big emotional impact uh, right away. And, um, uh, and so I was very pleased with the, the reaction to the Connaissance Concerto. You know, I love this composer, Guillaume Connaissance. And so we played the piano concerto with Jean-Yves Thibaudet. We played the saxophone concerto uh, with Timothy McAllister. And uh, I was very pleased as well with um, uh, um, some, some uh, other pieces like Anna Klein. Um, I love this piece, This Midnight Hour. And, uh, you know, it's for me very important to, um, to select pieces that have just been premiered and, and, and decide which one needs to be played again. When you do a premiere, a real premiere, world premiere, you cannot really be sure that this will be a great piece because every composer, even, even the, the greatest one, have done some piece that are less good or even boring sometimes. Uh, so we can forgive some composer to uh, deliver sometimes some piece that are not up to even their standard. But um, if it's not a premiere, then it's very important for me to choose pieces that can touch the heart and especially melodically. I'm, I come from the opera tradition and uh, for me, music has to sing all the time. That's wonderful. We have, a, we have a few questions, so I wanted to read a few. Which conductors of the past 40 or 50 years do you most admire and for what reason? Ah, um, <laughs> uh, I will answer this question. Thank you for this question. It, it happens that I mostly like uh, people from before. Uh, I almost <laughs> never listen to, um, to recent recordings. I have a strange theory that the Second World War did kind of break a little bit of the natural um, uh, meaning of music in the world. Uh, and, and so I, I usually try always when I walk, uh, uh, study a piece that is of course, uh, older than the Second World War, I tried to, um, to listen to very, very old recordings. So uh, I love a lot of conductors you may not even know, uh, like the French conductor uh, Coppola or Stram or um, uh, Wolf or these kind of people. And then uh, some people also from the 50s, 60s, like um, Charles Munch is my hero, uh, the French conductor, because there is such a an enthusiasm, a charm, a love for music. Uh, and then more recently, the conductor for the conductor is uh, obviously Carlos Kleiber. Uh, we, all conductors that I know, uh, just love Carlos Kleiber because it's just music personified. You know, it's just so beautiful to, you can read the beauty of the music in his gesture. So um, that is that. And I, I'll, uh, I'll give you a, um, a, a very good news. Uh, just now, I just read before uh, uh, online that the Orchestre de Paris appointed a 24 years old uh, uh, conductor called Klaus Mekele and uh, is a Finnish young conductor. And I'm so happy. It makes me so happy. I said to my wife, you see, I just told her, uh, I, I was right. I was right because um, I discovered him a few years ago. 
And I thought, I mean, he was only 20. And uh, I thought, oh my God, he's a big deal. He's really a wonderful, wonderful, great new conductor. It's rare. And, uh, and now he, he will get the Orchestra de Paris and it's fabulous news because they are in good hands. He's only 24, but he's top, really just wonderful. So voila, there is, just to say that I, I don't love only conductor from the old, old past and not only conductors that are old. I also Present, love. yeah. <laughs> and we, we've seen you work with younger emerging conductors in, in a mentoring um, role. And I've been really impressed by your generosity because this is a lifelong uh, learning and meaning being a conductor takes years and years and, and you've been extraordinarily uh, generous in, in how you share your knowledge and wisdom, but never controlling how they will come to their own. And I think that that also reflects really how you are as a, as a conductor, a leader on that podium is that um, you have convic conviction about conviction about the music, but really letting the artists really come to their own conclusion about how to get there. So, well, you know, it takes time. There are some things that, that will never be faster, like um, to make a nice, beautiful baby. It will still take somehow nine months, a bit less sometimes, but still, you know what I mean. And to make a very good wine, you still need years. Uh, and and I think music is the same. It's it's about the truth and. Uh, um, Sometimes now, you know, our world gets goes, spin faster and faster and uh, we forget that there are some things that takes time. And, yeah. uh, and we have person, still, yes. we, we still have 15 minutes. So there's three topics I want to touch on. And one that relates to what you just said is as a um, conductor artist who continues to mature and evolves, it, what are your dream works? What are the are, are projects that now that you're, um, you know, about, about to approach your second season as music director, thinking of the future, what are the projects that you would want to do and that, you know, in my career, I must, I must get to do these works? Or these <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm not really a kind of bucket list uh, guy, but I would say there is a dream, of course, which is that um, uh, I admire a conductor like Kusevitsky, who has, uh, uh, he was conductor of the Boston Symphony in the, um, I believe, uh, 40s. Uh, 40s, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he is 30, sorry, already in the 30s, of course, because he premiered uh, and commissioned a lot of pieces that, be, that are masterworks. And, um, and I really, for me, the most important would be to commission the right person, the right people at the right time, and inspire the composer, the right kind of idea uh, of a piece, uh, to, uh, to just help modestly the birth on this planet of uh, another masterwork that will stay for the rest of humanity. I mean, uh, I, I, I would love if I would help to have a new La Mer or a new whatever Brahms symphony of today. Uh, and it's possible, really. There are great, great, great composers. So it's all about taste, choosing, selecting. So this is for me... Um, uh, a, a special dream. It's about the new repertoire, you know, music of, of our time that is really as uh, great, if not greater than the past. And, uh, and I have hopes. Uh, a lot of people, I must say, think that uh, the golden age was before. And uh, I really don't believe so. I, I think we see a lot of uh, amazing composer. We see a lot of female composer uh, arriving today that are fantastic. And uh, uh, and yeah, I believe there is a lot of new music to, uh, to love and to discover. That's beautiful. And as a, I know as an opera lover that you have also big, big dreams of projects you'd love to, call, to bring to St. Louis at some point. Well, you know, we, we have at the end of this uh, next season, uh, a huge one, which is um, a wonderful Turandot of Puccini, which is an opera I love, one of the very first um, I heard and uh, saw live. And uh, I just hope that um, we'll be able, of course, by then, I'm an optimist, to, uh, to, to bring everybody on stage and a packed house together and, uh, and that we can enjoy this mm -hmm. fabulous opera. So yes, mm -hmm. I do love big pieces with vocal artists and uh, big choruses and great soloists. And, and uh, yeah, that's uh, something that we continue to do for sure.
Wonderful. So let's touch a, a little bit on 2021 season. We have a few questions and you and I with the team and with the um, support of our board are, are really thinking about what to offer our audience in the 2021 season. And we are uh, going to make an announcement sometimes around August 3rd about the shape, especially of our fall season. And we do plan to come back to give live performances and we have a medical team on, on, on site, infectious disease specialists who are advising us on building procedures on how to bring the audience back and how to sit an orchestra on the stage safely given the existing restrictions and given what we know and don't know about this virus. So we've, we've been at work and I know that you're developing various scenarios for the fall, but that would try as as much as possible to preserve the existing programs that you put together, uh, whether they are programs you conduct or whether they are programs that are going to be um, uh, guest conducted. So let me ask you, someone asked a question, if, you're, um, if your approach to live performances and listening to your audience would change as a result of the pandemic, and, and what has this crisis, if, if anything, has it changed the way you would approach a live performance or the way you, you conceive programs or, or concerts? Well, some people believe uh, the world will never be the same. And I make some comparison almost with, uh, you know, the, after the terrorist attack, after, you know, in the, in the airport now, you have to pass a metal detector forever. This will never change and this kind of thing. Except, of course, if um, technology would allow something different, but basically you still have to... Uh, to have this new way of doing things. I really don't believe so. I believe that, uh, look, in 1918, there was a big pandemic. There was before, the, and people at some point came back to hug and kiss and be together and uh, be close and enjoy proximity. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, this will come back uh, at some point. We need, of course, to, uh, to feel safe, uh, Hopefully, when the vaccine will be there, that would help a lot. But I'm absolutely sure that um, that this will uh, will come back. So now, I I believe this Plan B that we have, that we work on, and uh, uh, all these programs with basically the idea is to have a smaller, uh, you know, uh, uh, orchestras on stage and to do shorter concerts that you can repeat. And obviously, you will have less people in um, in the hall. So for me, this is just. Uh, um, for limited time, you know, we 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 will of course safety is first and health is first. So we we will do everything which is um, uh, good to be to be welcoming our audience and for the musicians to have of course no risk at all. Um, but I believe things will uh, will go positively here in Europe. It's changing a lot already. Um, every every week somehow things are, are improving and uh, I will conduct here in Belgium uh, Beethoven 7 uh, in July, uh, the 2nd of July, just um, uh, to, to experience the distancing and see how it works. I, uh, I spoke this morning with my dear friend Nicolai Snyder who was in Lyon and he was actually also doing Beethoven 7 and he said like, he explained to me, I was so curious, look, so how it is to have um, uh, you know, musicians so far away from each other. And he said, well, it's not easy for the balance. The woodwinds are so far, you don't hear them very well. And he told me things that, um, for instance, uh, uh, there is an issue, of course, with the, uh, now the, the violins, for instance, uh, the strings, people cannot share one stand. Mm -hmm. So one they stand. Have, they have one stand each, but then there is a little issue with turning pages because you cannot rely on your partner to turn the page while you still cover the end of the page. Uh, and and so, so so that was funny. We laughed. That would be like a tap, 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 just time for people to all turn the page. Um, but that we can resolve. It's just a joke. Uh, so. I think we will just do, for me, what is important is that the music is there. So we do everything which is needed to, to be safe, to make people comfortable, people at ease and feeling really safe. But uh, uh, I'm sure that we will progressively come back to what we know because this is a human way. This is what we need. We need to be together. We need to share that. We need to, uh, I mean, to, to, to just... Um, have this experience together of uh, feeling the wave of music being close to each other. And so I'm very hopeful that uh, uh, the world will go back to, uh, to normality for that, for this human aspect, for sure. Yep. 
Thank you. That's very inspiring, Stefan. Two final questions before we, we close our conversation. Uh, one participant wanted to know whether you, um, sometimes you conduct without a score. Hmm. And does that happen? And, and under what circumstances would you not use a, a score? Uh, well, you know, uh, the, 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 in an ideal world, I would conduct everything by heart uh, because it helps to have a visual contact with the orchestra all the time. And, and uh, I need to be careful because I, I so love to listen to them that I may have the tendency sometimes to, uh, to, to, to look actually vague because I'm listening. So I'm, I have this kind of eyes, not really focus on them, but just uh, uh, focus on my own listening. And uh, when I don't have a score, it, it's easier to just uh, uh, communicate with, with the eyes. So ideally, I would like to do that with every piece. Uh, I do not do it because um, there are some pieces I, 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 don't, I don't have time to learn it by heart or some of them are really tricky to know by heart. So uh, there is a, quite a big list, though I would try to be um, not fakely modest, of pieces <laughs> where, where, I, where I know well and I feel very comfortable to, uh, to conduct by heart, but it's never, uh, maybe people notice I, I, um, uh, I don't remove the, 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 the stand usually. I, uh, uh, I, I don't want people to, to kind of notice that so much. It's not so important, you know. Uh, it's just uh, for me, if the score is not there, it's definitely because I feel comfortable enough and, and the orchestra will not get nervous feeling, oh my God, you know, it will make a mistake. You know? uh, so it's only when I'm totally at ease and it happened with some of the you know, the most famous piece of the repertoire. I mean, the, the, I don't know, La Mer, Fantastique, uh, Brahms symphonies, all these kind of things, you know. So uh, then I, I dare to do that, but uh, I'm aging now. So, you know, the memory is not so easy to learn things by heart. So I'm afraid I won't conduct everything by heart, sorry. For many of us, you're a very, very young man. Uh, lastly, just during the pandemic, it was announced that you would be conducting the ceremony for the Nobel Prize. Um, and, and there was a lot of pride in St. Louis hearing about this. So can you remind us the event is in December and will it be? Oh, it, yes, it's it's big deal. I'm married to a Swedish lady, Ulfa, and uh, I can tell you her and uh, her parents, I mean, they are over the moon because in Sweden, it's a very prestigious concert, very. Uh, it happened in the uh, Stockholm Concert Huset, which is this, um, this very beautiful hall in the very center of Stockholm. It's blue outside, it's beautiful. And, uh, uh, and it's very formal. Uh, I will meet the, the queen and the king and the family and everybody at this occasion. So everybody in my family is very excited by that. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it's televised uh, on the first channel in Sweden at like eight o'clock at night. So it's really like, a, very big deal. So yes, I'm, um, I, I enjoy a very nice relationship with the Stockholm Philharmonic since many years. And, uh, uh, and, and it came very naturally. They just asked me, if you look at the list of people who conducted this concert, it's a, it's a very flattering list. So I'm very pleased to be uh, in that beautiful list of great conductors. And uh, uh, well, I'm looking forward to this Nobel Prize. It's very special. Well, we're very, very proud and we're very happy for you. We, we miss seeing you. We miss the end of the beautiful programming that you had planned for the 1920 season. But we know that we'll see you again in the fall and that we'll all come together very hopeful about a, a joyful uh, future and also with uh, all the great hopes of, of bringing live music again. And in closing, I, I want to say that we will send a link to the information about this noble ceremony, uh, if it's available online. And uh, we will indeed bring back the canceled uh, Berlioz and the rest of the programming that Stefan had planned this season. We will find a way as we plan future years to have Stefan bring those programs back. They were truly remarkable for so many reasons. And, and we feel that this is music we want to bring back to, to our stage for, for your enjoyment. Uh, so again, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Stefan, for your generous presence. Thank you. And um, as you saw from the introductory uh, slides, the Howard Witzma Challenge is uh, going on right now. This is a great way to encourage new friends
friends to support the orchestra and support the very important education work that we do and has continued despite the pandemic. Our team has been providing uh, music education tools for hundreds of teachers and parents in our state. So again, thank you. Thank you for your support. Stefan and I have contributed to the WISMA Challenge and we look forward to seeing you all again very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm so honored that you all took time to, uh, to be with me. I mean, music makes us together even overseas uh, during this pandemic, but uh, uh, I miss St. Louis, I miss the musicians, I miss the staff, I miss, miss everybody, and I can't wait to start my second season, and this will happen in September. Have a great summer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you all. Thank you. Big kisses.